again. If you don't know me, I am Zach Lawler. One more time, I'm the senior pastor here at Lake Havasu Baptist Church. And I know what you guys are thinking right now. I, I, you're like, I thought you said we were going to hear a sermon from a young, good-looking pastor. Um, but I'm going to have to do, okay? I'll fill in. I'll do the best I can. Um, today, we're going to hear another standalone message. We have a special message today. We're starting a brand new series next week. I'm really excited about you guys, so don't miss next Sunday. But if you want to leave today, you can get out of here. Actually, no, stick around. So we... Um, we're going to hear a special message today, and I've been saving this message for a long time now. I've been actually holding on to this one because I wanted to save it for the right time for the right group of people. And I think right now in this stage of our church, I have the right group of people in front of me. So, so we've been talking as a church leadership team for a long time now about what kind of church we're going to be and what we're going to stand for and how we're going to live out this mission as a church. And we always come back to one singular truth. If we're going to do the work of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to be a church that's focused on relationship. That is focused on purposeful, intentional, Christ-centered relationships. Everybody say purposeful, intentional, Christ-centered relationships six times fast. Okay, don't, <laughs> don't do that. But, but I've found there's, there's two types of relationships we need to focus on a church if we're going to strive. Number one is discipleship-focused relationships. I, I can preach until I'm blue in the face, you guys. I can get up here and get excited and scream about Christ, but you're really not going to grow best or those. You're going to grow best together as we spur each other along in Christ. Amen? So you need to form those relationships. Secondly, the best and most of effective way to share evangelism is through what I will call evangelistic relationships. When people know that you love them, when people know that we care about them, when people know that we would give our life for them, they're more likely to not only accept an invitation to church, but to receive Christ as their Lord. So we're going to focus on those relationships as well. And we've been talking a lot as a church leadership team, but in, in a broken and separated and messed up world, you guys should know, people are dying for personal connection. They're hurting for authentic, loving relationships. And I want to tell you, that's exactly where this church wants to step in and meet people. We want the broken to come in here and feel love. We want the separated and the downtrodden to hold their head up and hear about Christ. So that's what we're going to do. But I will tell you one thing. We need to talk about something today. If we're going to invite broken people into the church, you know what we're going to have, y'all? Conflict. I was waiting for somebody to be like, love. No, okay. <laughs> we're going to have love. It's going to be sweet. But sometimes it ain't. If, if, now here's the thing. You guys know this. Churches are not country clubs full of perfect people. Amen? Amen? It's a room full of broken, messed up, scarred, damaged individuals who are all trying to be healed by Christ. And when you take all those broken people and you stick them in one place, broken people hurt people. Because hurt people hurt people. Okay, so the question is, how are we going to deal with this stuff, you guys? How are we going to deal with the conflict as it comes up? How are we going to deal with all this stuff? What do we call it? The church drama. Amen? <laughs> Enough church drama to make you run back to your baby mama, right? Like, there's a lot of it sometimes. So how are we going to deal with it? So we're going to go to the Bible as we go to in all things and see if we can get some answers today on how we can deal with conflict as a community. And if we're going to be a church built on relationships, we have to be ready for with this stuff when it pops up. Not if it stop, pops up, but when it pops up. So we're going to be in Matthew 18 today. That, that famous verse on dealing with church conflict. Don't put it up on the screens yet. Who's in charge up there? My son's on the computer. Come on, Sean. I got to wait for the cue, man. All right? Um, but, but first, before we hop into the Bible, as always, you guys please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gentle kindness. We thank you, God, so much for your patience. Be patient with your people. Bless us today. Let this word speak to our hearts and minds. Let us transform us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, as we work out our sanctification with fear and trembling. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, you should know in Matthew 18, right before this, Christ goes through this wonderful story of the 99 sheep being left on the mountain hills as he goes and chases that one sheep down. Who here loves that verse? Right? I don't, every time I hear that verse, I picture Jesus leaving like 99 beautiful, healthy sheep behind and chasing me through the woods when I was like this ugly, disformed goat, you know, and, and chasing me down. But it's this beautiful reminder of God's heart for the lost and for the broken. And it's amazing that right after that, Christ transitions from a passage about dealing with conflict. It's almost like God knew if we chase down that one broken, lost person and bring him into the church, there's going to be drama, right? 
there's going to be some problems. So let's hear Christ's words. These are the words of Jesus himself. And we're going to ask this question, how should we deal with conflict in the church? Or how should I deal with conflict in my life? Because this really transfer, transfers over to every area of your life. So we're going to be in verse um, 15 to start. Matthew 18. Are you guys ready? Stole my wife's bubbly this morning. It's pretty good. Things are always better when they're stolen. That's not true. Don't listen to me. All right. In verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him, what church? Say it again. Ooh, you gossipers are dying right now. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. You guys should know that's found in the book of Deuteronomy. It's Old Testament teaching. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Hmm? Highlight that, circle it. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a what church? And a tax collector. Jeez, it's a rough ending there. All right, you know, guys, you know what this passage always reminds me of? In every conflict, in every problem you'll face in life with somebody else, you're always either going to have a Doug or a Teresa. Can I have a witness up in here? What? You're always going to have a Doug or a Teresa. What do I mean? Let me give you some explanation. You guys are like, what is he talking about, right? Is this in one of those pastoring books we haven't read yet? No. You guys should know I grew up with two wonderful siblings. I had an older sister, Teresa, my protector, and I had a younger brother, Doug, my best friend. And, and here's the thing. I was the middle child. You guys know the middle child is always what? The peacemaker. Amen? Anybody in here have to be that person? I was the peacemaker. My wife's the middle child. She was a peacemaker. And, and I quickly learned to discover when my sister was upset, when I had sinned against her, and when my brother was upset, when I sinned against him. But they are two very different people. See, here's the thing. When you hurt Teresa's feelings... You had no idea. You would just notice her absence from your life. Anybody have a sibling or a family member or a friend? You would know she was mad because you got the old, so wonderful, silent treatment. Anybody getting silent treatment from their wife right now in church? I love silent treatment, that passive aggressiveness. That was my sister. She was what I would call a conflict avoider. Anybody want to raise their hand and admit to being that person right now? Don't put your hand up. Come on. <laughs> Two of them right there. Hope we don't get in conflict. Y'all are going to run. Don't run from me. Secondly, you had your Dugs. Now, Doug did not avoid conflict. Doug woke up every morning choosing one thing, war, right? That was Doug. If you upset Doug, if you sinned against Doug, you knew it because you got punched, okay? When Doug was mad, it was amazing. He would turn bright red from head to foot, clench his hands, and just swing his arms. And anything that got in the way was getting hit. It didn't matter who it was. Man, animal, woman, tree, it was going down, okay? I had a couple instances as a kid where he actually upset, was upset by a couple of friends from my, from my football team, and he beat them both up in the front yard, okay? And, and I was like, you should have ran faster, all right? But that was Doug. Doug is what I would call a conflict creator, okay? So here's what I'm saying. What do I mean by this? How does this apply? I will tell you, in life, at work, in the professional work, and so much at church, you're usually going to run into a Teresa or a Doug. Someone who runs from conflict or someone who comes looking for war. Have you guys dealt with those kind of people in your personal conflicts? So here's what I want to ask the church right now. Which one do you think we should be in a conflict? The Teresa or the Doug? Thank you so much. You guys are so smart. Be the middle sibling in the situation. That is what Jesus is saying. Be the peacemaker. Don't avoid the conflict. Don't run into the conflict looking to throw hands, right? Go to the conflict seeking peace. Back to Bible, Jesus' words. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. Say it again, church. Alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Don't miss this. Jesus is not telling you to clench your fists and run at that person looking for war. He's telling you to come into that situation with a sense of peace, a sense of looking for reconciliation. And I love this because Jesus is so smart. It's almost like he's the God of the universe, right? But here's what he's saying. He knows, Jesus knows, when you run towards a conflict right away, it solves it almost immediately. It doesn't have time to fester. It doesn't have time to build up and destroy your relationship. It's a wonderful principle. Also, there's a secondary reason, and this happens to me all the time. Sometimes the person that hurt you 
the person that broke your heart, the person that sinned against you, you'll go to them one-on-one and tell them what they did, and they have no idea why you're upset or that they hurt you. Have you guys ever experienced that? You're upset, you're hurt, you can't get by in life, and they have no idea this is going on. So this principle really helps you to just let people know that there is an issue, to, to let them know there's a problem so you can fix it. I will tell you guys, I am so thankful for my wife in many ways, right? But my wife is wonderful because if there is a problem, you want to know real quick, okay? I will tell you right now, if you're in this church and you sin against my wife, you're going to get an email, a text, and a call, all right? You're, you're going to know, and not in a violent or a forceful or a mean way. My wife hates church drama. She hates drama. She doesn't like to let things fester. She just comes at you with it, and she wants to fix it on the spot. And that's blessed me in marriage so many times. But I don't know about you guys. Have you ever met a guy that, or a husband that was like the, the passive-aggressive husband that just gives her, her, his wife the silent treatment for like three weeks, and she has to come into the pastor's office to figure out why he's upset, you know? So I, I was actually thinking about this, though, you guys. Which person do you think we most usually experience in the church when it comes to church conflict? Do you think we run into more Dougs or Treases or middle kids? Dang it, I have no reason to give the sermon. You guys know it already. I can tell you most of the time I run into a bunch of Treases because they just flee from the conflict. Here's what happens in the church congregation. Usually they, they act like they're not hurt and they let it boil and fest over and then they just run from the church. And I think I was trying to think about the reason why we do this as a church body. I think, you guys, it's because we've been lied to as a church and been told that if you confront someone one-on-one, it's mean, confrontational, or unchristian. Have you guys ever felt that way? Like, I can't go to them one-on-one. It's going to be awkward and terrible, and they're going to think I'm this mean, awful person. So So we let it fester, and here's what breaks my heart. A lot of the time when we behave that way in church, we get our feelings hurt, it boils over, we explode, and then we leave the congregation. But what does Christ say? He says, go to your brother one-on-one, and if you do this and they admit their fault, you have gained a brother. Meaning, you guys have seen this so many times, conflict can actually be used to grow you closer to somebody. It can actually bless your relationship if you're able to work through some of these things together. I've done it in marriage, I've done it as a father, I've done it as an employee, and I've done it several times in the church. This practice works, you guys. Next time you have a problem with somebody, go right to them, let them know what's going on, and let God work it out. Don't skip Jesus' cycle here. But I will tell you, um, I've had to live this out in the church more recently. Do you guys think your pastor ever makes mistakes? The elders allow me one a day. It's great. I get one one and a half on Sunday. But uh, (laughs) I've burned through them already, Uh, just in this sermon alone. Right, so... Uh, I remember a while ago, one of the elders had the unaffor- like really unfortunate gift of being the basketball coach for two of my kids at the same time. You want to talk about a curse and not a blessing, try that job right there, right? And he was coaching my kids at a basketball game. <laughs> I get rowdy at basketball games, you guys. And I remember one game, my, one of my sons, who remain unnamed, just started running over every kid on the basketball court. I mean, he's flattening kids out left and right. It's like a massacre out there. I was enjoying it, okay, but I felt kind of guilty at the same time, all right? And, and I remember it boils over to the point where this, the opposing coach of the other team starts screaming at my son. Y'all, I let my papa bear come out a little bit, okay? Okay, let, I let my ghetto papa bear come out a little bit, okay? <laughs> I said some things at that game that I could never say from the stage, but it gets better. The, the elder got yelled at by me, too. Maybe a little bit, okay? And I remember Matthew 18 popped in my head. And, and after, right after the game, I went to that elder and I said, Brother, I am so sorry for the way I behaved. Can you please forgive me? And please don't tell the other elders what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, guys, he, he accepted my apology. He came at me with grace. He said, Zach, I think the other coach kind of deserved it, right? And maybe not some of the words you used, amen? And... <laughs> And then the greatest thing is he never told the elders, so they're never going to find out I did that, all right? But this brings us to our first point, how should I face conflict in my life? Number one, don't run from it, run to it, but do so in peace. Hear me, if you guys have your notes out, write peace right next to that point, okay? We're not supposed to run into conflict with our fists clenched and our face red in anger. We're supposed to run into it looking for reconciliation, okay? Okay. But I know what some of you are thinking. If you've been down this path and you've had conflict with somebody, you went to them, 
You talked to him about how you were hurt. You told him what the problem was. You asked for forgiveness for something you've done. And you get a, how about, no, I don't forgive you. Or you get a, I have no idea what you're talking about. Or you get a, hey, you're being way too sensitive. Have you ever, guys ever received that? Or you get somebody who stonewalls you. This is called gaslighting. They actually convince you that you're the problem. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this in one of those situations. So the question is, what do we do if we go to the person one-on-one and we don't get any resolution? It just actually boils over and gets worse. Thank God we have a wonderful, beautiful creator named Jesus Christ who goes on. He says this, But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. We already established that's actually teaching from the book of Deuteronomy on how to deal with conflict or, or sin within the body. But this is amazing. I want you guys to hear this. I want to step back. Can I get on a soapbox as your pastor a little bit? No. You know what Christ is not saying? You know what God is not saying? Hear me, not saying. He's not saying, skip step one, go find two of your best friends, and go attack that person as a unified Christian Gestapo mob. He's not saying that. And I can't tell you guys how many times in a church I've seen people skip step one because it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. They get two of their best friends, you know, like the pastor's wife and her cousin who's kind of gangster, right? And they go approach the person and they start this huge brawl and the three of them team up on the one person to convince them they're wrong. That is not what Christ is saying. Christ would want you to go not find a Doug or a Teresa. Christ wants you to go find two middle children, amen, and go approach the person so you guys can work out a peaceful resolution. I want you guys to hear this in every step of the way. Christ is not telling you to prove who is right and wrong. He's telling you to find a way to find a peaceful resolution to the situation. Sometimes that means confronting sin. Sometimes that means going after a problem. And sometimes that means you are actually the problem. I've actually done this before. I've, I've, I went through step one, jumped into step two. We, the three of us went to talk to the person And the two witnesses I brought with me and the other person all discovered that I was actually the problem. Have you guys ever had that happen? It's a fun experience, okay? (laughs) Like, here's the point. Those witnesses, those men or those women with you might actually divulge that maybe both are you the problem, right? You're both hurt people hurting people in the situation, and they might call both of you to repentance and love. So, so we, get, we get through that step, and here's, here's what happens. I, I know what you guys are thinking as a church. Like, what if we go through the step of trying to work it out one-on-one, and then we go through the second step, and we try to work it out with a group, and the person says, you know what, go ahead and pound sand, right? Because I will tell you, in my experience, the kind of person that will look at someone one-on-one and say, hey, I'm not the problem you are, is the same kind of person that will look at a group of three people and say, I'm not the problem, y'all's the problem, okay? What do we do if that happens? I just want to remind you guys in every single step of the way, I'd like to go through a teaching in Galatians 6, but it says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Not, not in a way of war, not in a confrontational, ugly manner, but with the spirit of gentleness. So we get to this third point. So say the first two steps don't work. You get nowhere in life. You, you can't come to any sort of resolution You guys are battling and fighting it out as a group of four. The guy refuses or the lady refuses to repent. What's next? Great question. Let's go back to the Bible. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, I've got to make a point here, you guys, because I've seen this get out of cattywampus in a church, too. I need to make a huge point. This last step is only for a confessing believer in Jesus Christ. This last step is really meant for members of the church. Why am I bringing that up? Don't come at me in my office as a pastor with your boss from Subway and say you're upset because he's not giving you a raise, okay? The best thing I can do as a pastor is watch you publicly get fired. I have no authority over your boss. It's even crazier, though, some of us are married to non-believing people, and I hope they come to Christ someday, but here's the really hard part. You can't drag your unbelieving spouse into the pastor's office and expect your spouse to force them to act some way. Like, I have no authority over a non-believing spouse. Neither do my elders. Okay, so this last step is really for those who confess a belief in Jesus Christ. And the point is, the elders, I've actually only seen it come to this point one time in my entire career, because who wants to sit down and face a group of elders? Raise your hand. Sounds like a terrible morning, doesn't it? It's not somewhere you want to be facing down a group of elders telling them why everybody around you is wrong and you're the only right person. It's a rough place to be. 
But what if that person goes through all three steps and they still refuse to repent? Christ says, if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be like a Gentile or a tax collector. And I will say this, if you guys find yourself in this point and you're refusing to repent, it's probably a good time to take a self-reflection about what you really believe. Because in, in this situation, what is Christ saying? If they're refusing to submit to a brother, to s- brothers and sisters, and to the body of the church, then they're acting like someone who has no influence from the Holy Spirit. Do you guys see that? They're acting like somebody who doesn't know God. This is not a way a believer behaves. A believer is willing to admit when they're wrong. A believer is willing to submit to the leadership of the church. And a believer should always look for peace and resolution to a situation. All right. Now, um, I want to point this out. You guys, have you guys seen this passage kind of used as a way to (sighs) excommunicate people from a church? I've seen this passage misused, and it kind of breaks my heart as a pastor, where, where it may be a, a leadership in a church or somebody has a problem with somebody, and they go through the first couple steps, they hit the third step, and they kick them out of the church. Treat them as a tax collector, a Gentile. But I want to remind you guys, who ate lunch and sat with the Gentile and the tax collector? Here's the point, you guys. You can treat them as a non-believer because they're behaving like a non-believer, but that does not mean they don't need to still come to Christ. It doesn't mean we have to excommunicate them from our lives. It means we treat them in a way that they are behaving. We treat them as someone we're still trying to evangelize to. So I want to come to my second point. How should I face conflict in my life? Number one, don't run from it. What, church? Run to it. Number two, don't look to win in this situation. Look to forgive first. And I love the Bible, you guys, because the Bible's moving, the Bible's alive, but I can picture Jesus' disciples hearing this argument, right? (laughs) And Peter's standing in the back, and he's like, how is this going to work out in a practical sense, right? Here's what Peter's wondering, how many times should I forgive my brother? Like, what if I go to my brother and he sinned against me, like the, the pastor yelling at the poor elder, right? How many times can he come and ask for forgiveness before the church goes, that's it, there's enough, there's no more grace for you? Have you guys ever had someone hurt you and you forgive them and they hurt you again and you forgive them and they hurt you again and they forgive them and you get to a point where I'm starting to look like the fool in the situation? Here's Peter's heart. Like, like how many times should I forgive a brother if he sins against me? There's got to be a limit to this grace, Jesus. We read about it in 18, 21 through 22. It says this, Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I say to you not seven times, but what church? Seven. Seventy-seven times. Some, I think some verse, verses in the Bible use like a calculation there. It's like 70 times seven, right? Does anybody's translation say that? But here's the point. This is awesome because I love how human the disciples really were. You guys should know there's a, there's a ton of things behind the scene here because Peter and Jesus both knew something in rabbi teaching and rabbinical teaching of the rabbis. They taught you, you guys know how many times they taught you to forgive somebody for sinning against you? three times the jewish people had a three strike rule you sin against me three times you don't get a fourth time does anybody have that rule in life right now you get three strikes okay so so here's the point peter peter's looking at jesus and he's saying i got an idea peter you're jesus you're always talking about all this forgiveness stuff how about i forgive people twice as many times plus one because i'm such a generous guy right peter's being so generous here and, and, it, and here's the point, right? On the, on the eighth sin, do not pass the love, do not collect $200, you're out of the church, right? But I love Jesus' response. I say to you not seven times, but 77 times. And don't miss this. Christ is not looking for an actual number, right? He, he's giving a general number to say, keep forgiving your brother because I keep forgiving you. That's the point. Right? I, I thought about this, you guys. What if we practiced this? Like, what if we got lost and our wives actually had a ledger and on, like, the 78th offense, they left us? Could you guys imagine that? I can tell you, if my wife had a journal of wrong, she's well past 77 on me right now. Amen? But then I started thinking, what if Christ kept the ledger on our sins? What if on the 78th sin, Christ just dropped us from the family? But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, love keeps no record of wrong. And neither should we. Christ doesn't hold it against you, so we're not going to hold it against them. But I was thinking about this, you guys. Do you ever, I I just brought this up a minute ago. Have you ever forgiven somebody so many times that you feel like they're winning and you're losing? 
In a world where, where we forgive people when they keep wronging us, it feels like they're winning the battle and we're losing. And I think the question becomes, how many times can I keep taking an L in this life? But I want to bring us to our big idea today. We need to change the way we feel about winning and losing as a Christian church. And this is our big idea. Forgiving others does not mean they win. It means sin loses. Forgiving others does not mean they've won the war. It means that the sin has lost the war. Here's the the point, you guys. It's not about winning and losing in the Christian faith. It's about bringing glory to Christ. Amen? We have to be willing to lose some battles if it brings glory to Christ. We have to be willing to take the L in some situations if it means bringing peace to the body. We win as believers not when we're proven right or when we get some sort of justice. We win instead when Christ is glorified in that relationship, when we allow love to prevail. And you guys, you should know in my life, I talk about my family sometimes, me and my wife's families, I bring them up sometimes, and I compare them to an episode of Jerry Springer. You know, like there's some issues in my family. Any witnesses in here? Anybody got some messed up family members? Any got some skeletons in the closet? Amen. Okay. I will tell you my family couldn't be on Jerry Springer because we couldn't get them all paroled to be there. (laughs) I'm glad you guys are laughing. Ouch, right? But, But here's the thing. Me and my wife have been hurt. We've had people sin against us in our family. We've had family members step on us. We've had family members steal from us. We've had family members max out credit cards in our name when we were pregnant with our second kid. And trust me, as a worldly person, we've had every reason to write them off, amen? Three strikes, four strikes, you're out. You're out of my life. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not going to lose this one. But I got this wife. She won't give up on people. And there's several family members that she just keeps forgiving and extending grace and forgiving and extending grace. And even me as a pastor, I've gotten to the point like maybe we're forgiving too much. But here's the crazy thing, you guys. Over the last couple years, three of those family members have come to Jesus Christ. It's almost like, you guys, I was thinking about this. It's not just that we show our love as Christians through being kind, it's when we love people who are unlovable. It's when we continue to forgive people who others would have shunned away. It's when we extend that grace to the people that the world has lost grace for. And I'll tell you, when we do those sorts of things, we see Christ win. Will you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, if we're going to be a kind of church that welcomes in every broken, messed up person in these doors, God, we're going to face conflict. God, I would would pray and hope that you make us the kind of peacemakers that seek resolution, that seek a way out, to, to let love win, God. But Lord, in everything as a church, as a congregation, as a pastor, as a leadership team, and all of us, let us never be the kind of people that withhold grace. Let us be the kind of people that want to see love and grace win. Let us be the kind of people that want to see you prevail in every situation, God. Let us love others in a way they don't deserve. And let us forgive more times than we should. That in the end, Christ, you might win. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.